us honor our King. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Ketchiano BeMitzvot Vidbanu Lishmoa Kol Shofar. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the Universe, who has sanctified us with His commandments and has commanded us to hear the voice of the Shofar. spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivon Malchuto Leolam Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elochecha bechol elavcha uvchol nafshicha uvchol meodecha ve'hayu hadavrim ha'ele asher anochi mitzav chayom alevavecha ve'shinan tam levenecha ve'did barta bam be'shivtecha bevetecha uvlechtecha v'derek uvshakpicha uvikumecha Ukshartam sharta'am le'ot al yodecha Ve'hayu le'todavot b'ananecha Uktavtam al mezozot betecha Uvisharecha Ve'ahavta l'reha kamocha You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. We have an announcement, maybe a reveal. Well, we just want to praise Yahweh, healthy baby. Yay. Uh, probably sooner rather than later, uh, measure me two weeks early, but we are trading our bows in for bow ties. I felt that too, and you did too. Awesome, I love that. Our bows for bow ties. That's precious. Do you have it? Oh my goodness, that's right, that's right. So tell us your news. We are expecting probably... Mid-February, number nine. Number nine. <laughs> Congratulations. So we pray a healthy baby and this blessing over your sweet one, too. All right. So let's open up the treasure chest and get some out. Very, very good. All right. And Samuel, if you guys will all point your hands to the treasure chest, Samuel's going to lead us in the prayer. Abba, open their eyes to receive their truth in Yeshua's name. Amen. And all together say, by his grace, not one will be lost. Amen. May Yahweh protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining.
together. You shall say before Yahweh your Elohim, I have removed the sacred portion from my house and also have given it to the Levite and the alien, the orphan and the widow, according to all your commandments, which you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. I have not eaten of it while mourning, nor offered any of it to the dead. I have listened to the voice of Yahweh, my Elohim. I have done according to all that you have commanded me. Look down from your holy habitation from heaven and bless your people Israel and the ground which you have given us, a land flowing with milk and honey as you swore to our fathers. Amen. Baruch Adonai Hamivarak Leolam Vaed Baruch Adonai Hamivarak Leolam Vaed 
Barukata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Ashir Bachar Banamri Kol HaAmin Benatan Lanu Et Torato Barukata Adonai Noten HaTorah Amen Bless Yahweh the Blessed One. Blessed is Yahweh the Blessed One for all eternity. Blessed are you, O Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Yah, giver of the Torah. Amen. I just want to talk to you about the cost of a fresh anointing. Jesus said the Father anointed him to preach the gospel. When I hear it, I know that it's a man or woman that's touched God. And when I hear it, I'm convicted. When I hear it, I'm moved. When I hear it, I know I'm driven to my knees. And there's such a weightiness about it that I can't ignore it. I have to deal with it. You see, God does not give the anointing to lazy preachers, lazy Christians. He won't do it. There's a cost to the anointing where you will never again be satisfied as long as you live without seeing God at work in you and walking with you. And I, I had to travel all over the United States. Promoters got a hold of it, Christian promoters. And I, I, I traveled for, I think, two months, t national television, radio television, and it went around the world and I became what some would call famous. I know what it's like to have the anointing and I know when it's lifted. I know when I don't have it. I know when the death moves in. And folks, I got so busy that there's no hunger, there's no brokenness, there's no cry. When I go into the scriptures, I look at men that God has used, and there's always been a cry. Jeremiah said, I engage my heart to seek the Lord. And you'll find that there was a cry. There is nothing worse that I can think of for a man of God or a woman of God than to lose the anointing of God and be dead and have the knowledge that something is wrong. I was known around the world as a man of God and yet growing lukewarm and cold in my heart that every kind of temptation out of hell the devil saying I'm going to destroy you I'm going to kill your minister I'm taking you down you see when you don't have this touch this anointing and if you are not shut in with God and you're not serious about the things of God and you're happy with the status quo, you have this inner struggle. How do I get back? How do I get this anointing? How, how do I? Are, are you examining your heart like I had to do? It's not enough to be called. I'm still called. God still loved me. I think that all true ministry comes out of intimacy. I say it again, all true ministry, you know, it comes out of intimacy with Christ. Because the Lord said, you know the cost. You know what it's going to take. Seek in my face. Ezra set his heart to seek the face of God. Nehemiah, he hears the destruction that happened in Jerusalem. And the Bible says he was overcome with grief and he set his heart to seek God. He set his heart. You'll find it all through the Old Testament. He set his heart. Because you're going to have to make up a mind when you get in your 50s or 60s where you're just going to retire and you're going to take it easy. God can't allow anybody to retire anymore from the ministry. If you've ever been touched, you've ever been anointed of God, you don't have time. You've got to say, God, use me. I don't care where you send me. I don't care where you want me to go, but I'm not going out with my spirit drained. I'm not going out a dry stick. I want the anointing. I want the touch of God. I'm speaking to everybody, but the pa pastors in particular, I speak from my heart and I'm going to tell you, if you believe these are the last days, folks, ha have you not seen prophecy fulfilled in the last few years? It's going lightning speed. You hear the secular world screaming that the time is up. And you set your mind, you set your heart now by an act of faith, by hearing the word of God and laying hold of it. God, I hear you. I know that you've been stirring my heart. 
I know I have some issues and I want to deal with them. I want to walk with you, but I want an anointing. I want my people to know when I stand in the pulpit again that something has touched my life. There's a change in me. God does miracles when you begin to seek His face and get back to the simplicity of this and you devour this Word of God and you stay there. You turn everything down. But here's Daniel now and he said, I ate no present bread and you're going to be fasting, friends. This won't happen until God sees something in you and me of determination. God, I want this. I will not let you go until you anoint me again. Don't miss what God's about to do. Don't miss it. God help me, I'm not going to miss it. I'm going out clinging to Him. That this anointing is available to any man, any woman who set their heart. You're calling so many, I can feel it so strong. You're calling them. You're wooing them saying, now, in these meetings, here, not another time, you've made me promises before, but now, tonight, open your heart and say, God, once again, use me. And he's, he's saying, I have wooed you so many times, this time, if you pay the price, I'll open doors for you speak through you and I'll use you again like you have never conceived. Does that speak to us in so many different ways? You know, the first words out of my mouth, I want them to be how great he is. The greatness of our Father. The greatness of our Messiah, our Savior. Yeshua, their goodness, their power. We just came through a season from Passover, Pesach, to Pentecost, Shavuot, okay? And we have been talking about even the power. I've got notes here again, but as I talked to, as I talked to my brother recently, my twin brother, he recently told me he went up behind the lectern the Father's territory here, as I told my wife, I always emphasize this right here, this spot, this area is his. And I pray that I'm worthy to speak words that will touch lives. This is his territory. But as my brother told me, he says, the father let me know, just get, go up there, Gary, and let me fill your mouth. I've got notes. I've got a general theme. That was called The Cost of the Anointing by David Wilkerson. You can title this message, A Fresh Anointing. We each, in different ways, need a fresh anointing. We need a fresh anointing individually, corporately, even as a nation. We need His Spirit, especially right now, poured out on this nation even, and the nations. And I will say something about that before I step down. But I am so moved continually of my insufficiencies, of my flesh, of my weaknesses. And I've had to come to grips for years, being in the ministry in different capacities. And I think Brother Mark, Pastor Mark, you can say the same thing. And any of us who have been in any type of ministry, you feel your flesh so much of the time. You, you see and realize the weaknesses that you have and the flaws. And it's not easy always to get up here in his spot. It's not. But you know, when he tells you to step forward... You step forward, and we've heard that word since the spring, step forward, go forward. And that's what David Wilkerson was talking about. Go forward in a new anointing, and there is a cost to the anointing. There's a price to be paid. Are you, am I, are we willing to pay that price to receive the type of anointing in these days that we live in that we are absolutely going to need? We are living in perilous times. We are living in times like men and women have really not seen in some ways. And I'll say something about that later. But I just wanted to come up here a lot. And I don't want to know sometimes myself what's coming next, what the Spirit, the Father will put in me, what He will breathe in me to say. But, I, you know, 
I want it always, Father, to be about your words, your message, your power, your greatness, your love, your goodness, your justice, your righteousness. Not, not me, not any of us that have this spot any given Shabbat or Sabbath. I'm telling you, I feel this. I told my wife, this is no small thing. You know, those disciples, Peter was standing there. Can't you get this mental image of Peter and the rest of the disciples, but especially Peter, when he denied Yeshua three times? He was probably standing just outside that fire, you know, that fire that night, the light where they couldn't see him real good, and he was hurting. He was hurting. Make no mistake, Peter was hurting. The disciples were hurting. Their world had been turned upside down because of what had happened, and they didn't fully yet realize or understand what Yeshua had tried to tell them all along. That would come later. We know what happened at the end of Luke 24 in the first chapter of Acts where great power came upon them, and they turned the world upside down. If we don't have a fresh anointing, we can't follow in their footsteps, individually, collectively, corporately. And I'm not just talking about River Life. I'm talking about whoever's watching this video, hearing these words. He has got his people, his children everywhere. I am addressing the body at large, and I'm talking about even across the nations, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, Germany, wherever. But they were, they were confused and they were bewildered. And what happened? He showed up again on the shoreline and says, you got anything to eat? They cooked some fish. He ate with them. And he said a lot of things to them. And he did a lot of things with them. And you know, they marched out with a fresh new anointing. And they turn the world upside down. He is looking for those of us now in this day and age to send forth, to step forward, and to turn the world upside down. And it's going to happen, folks. Whether we come along for the ride or not, he will get those who will step forward, take the mic, speak up, act up. We've got people all across this nation right now, and I praise them, I thank them for it. People, individuals, women and men are stepping up in every sphere of life right now because of what is going on. I respect that. I honor that. I may not understand it all. You may not either. And let's not, let's be careful not to denigrate that or throw a certain judgment shade upon that. We got men and women appearing before school boards. We got many women appearing in, that's in the legislature, state, National senators, congressmen who are doing all that they can to turn this nation around, to turn it back to righteousness and justice. Like Isaiah 5.24 says, let justice and righteousness flow down like a river. And they're stepping forward. It takes courage, as I heard last night, Brother Morgan. It takes courage to take a mic and step forward in certain venues because they know, certain individuals know, in these days and times we're living, they could get their head cut off. The dear, precious apostle, the apostle Paul had to lay his head down and get it chopped off. But you know what he said? He says, I fought the good fight. I've conquered. So even if that is someone's fate, our eternity is what matters. You know, there, there is a reason, as I said, this is, this is not scripted. I, I myself don't know fully what I'm going to say up here. I don't. I'm just being very open and honest. As I talked with you the other day, Pastor Mark, ever since I've been speaking on my open book, you see what you get, you get what you see. The Father wants pure-hearted people. And by the way, a little, just a little side note here. Any of those of you who speak, be who you are. Be who he created you to be. He didn't create you to be anybody else, to speak like anybody else. Be yourself. In Him, okay? Just, just a little encouragement, love, and admonition. But there is a reason that He created the fivefold ministry. An apostle, as I've always said, is at the top of what I call the spiritual food chain. 
a true apostle, and I said a true apostle, so there are men and women out here who's got the title apostles, and they are not true apostles of Yahweh. They are not. They're not representing Yeshua truly. But a true apostle is needed in our midst. And I'm yet myself, this is me personally, I've yet to meet one, a true apostle. I think they're coming. As I've said in the past, true prophets are coming. You cannot have his return without having the fivefold ministry wrap Pastor Mark in place and functioning according to their purpose. An apostle, in a certain way, can never get in the lane or interfere with a pastor. But a pastor can't interfere with an apostle. A prophet cannot. Prophets have to be allowed to speak. They have to be allowed to run in their lane that Yahweh commissioned them with. In fact, if you study carefully, we heard last week some of us, Bill Cloud, talk about some things of the Nazarite vow. A true prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they were raised up in some regards outside the normal priesthood. Yahweh did that for a reason. They weren't part of the Levitical system per se. You understand what I'm saying? But they couldn't get in the way of the Levites. The Levites couldn't get in their way. When King Uzziah went in there and tried to sacrifice, that was the duty of the priest. What happened? He turned leprous, leprous, and then he was ostracized from Israel from that day forward. We've all been called to run in certain lanes. We've talked about this before, but it's so important that we start to understand this better. A prophet, Pastor Mark, must never interfere with your job or the elders here. But vice versa, you the elders must not interfere with the function, the calling of an apostle, a true apostle, or a true prophet, or an evangelist, fivefold minister, a teacher. This is a challenge down the road that he's going to work with the son. That's the encouraging word. We're going to get this right eventually. There's going to be some rough spots. Or there already are some rough spots. But there's many churches out there, many assemblies, many congregations, call them what you will, that will not allow the fivefold minister to work. I could call him a name. I'll be gracious and not do so. If a true prophet or an apostle walks in a lot of congregations today, or tomorrow for that matter, they will not be allowed to speak or to function in their calling. That's not right. That's not Yahweh's way. That's not the Father's wish. I'm speaking very plain. You're hearing my heart. You're hearing what he's put on my heart. He cannot and will not return, Yeshua, until that fivefold ministry is functioning like it should. Am I correct in saying that John the Baptist prepared his way the first time a prophet? His way has to be prepared by these ministries, okay? And that's coming. It's already, it's already been set in motion. But those disciples, they were bewildered and they were lost. But my look what happened. Man, when he breathed, it says in the last part of Luke, Luke 24, when he breathed into them and they finally understood the scriptures, he says, wait, wait, wait until great power comes upon you. You will be wrapped in and clothed in power. And that's why they could even give their lives in martyrdom death, every one of them except John. They couldn't kill him. We know why. Because great power had been bestowed on them, but they turned lives upside down. They changed lives. And I'll tell you, most of all, most of all, as Yeshua said, you will know my disciples because they love one another. Those disciples had that fresh anointing, and most of all, they marched out. They went forward in great love for people and for the nations. Some of you may not know this, those disciples, those 12, did not just stay in the, the Jerusalem area, in case you don't know this, some of you. There's history and records that show this and verify this, and it's registered in different museums. They went to places like the British Isles. They went to Spain. They went, they went all over the known world basically at that time because that was what they were told to do. Yeshua said, come, follow me. He said in Matthew 10, 5, I am sending you even to the lost sheep of Israel, the lost house of Israel. I've often told you, now let this register in your minds. It's historical. George Rawlinson and others, Josephus, wrote about it. There was so many Israelites just across that Euphrates River from the ten tribes. They couldn't even be counted. And some of those disciples went and ministered to those tribes. Issachar, Zebulun, Gad. 
We focus too much at times on Judah, and we love Judah. We love our Jewish brethren and sisters, yes, but we forget those other tribes were out there, and they're still out there. And prophetically, when Eddie stood up here weeks ago, that really registered me about it's bringing the exiles back. The 12 tribes, folks, are coming back. They're being brought back. That's part of his master plan. And right now, don't ask me to explain every nuance of it. I'm, I'm having to learn more and more by the week, by the day, by the year. This has been a lifetime study even for me. You probably hear the passion in my voice. It's not my passion. It's his passion. Yahweh is passionate about unifying everything, unifying the tribes, bringing all the nations under his reign, his loving, just, righteous reign. The passion you see in me and some of us is his passion. It's his passion for the tribes of Israel. Brother Zeke, Brother Arnold. I mean, I have a passion. You heard David Wilkerson said he has put a cry in some of us. If there's not a cry in us about some things, what are we doing here? What are we doing showing up? If it's not about him, if it's not about his purpose, if it's not about his plans, what are we doing showing up? You know, I think, talking about a fresh anointing, I, thought about, I, I think about Moses. Moses, <laughs> I think Moses knew his calling before he fled Egypt. Maybe not completely. I know Chuck Swindell sells in his book on Moses, and Chuck uses a lot of Hebrew terminology, that Moses knew a lot his calling, his destiny. I think he did a lot too, and you go to the book of Acts, and I won't spend a lot of time there where it infers that. He thought he was doing what he should have done when he murdered the Egyptian, and he fled. You know the story. Forty years, 40 years on the backside of nowhere, herding dumb sheep. Well, guess what? The Lord was getting them ready to herd dumb people. <laughs> Good preparation. Anybody that's ever dealt with sheep knows what I'm talking about. There's a reason he uses sheep to describe us, but oh, how he loves us. Peter, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. You know, those of us who have been in even official ministry, if you don't love, if he doesn't bring you to love people, you don't need to be there. That's the bottom line. Because you may, have to, you may be called upon to die for people. Greater love has no man, Yeshua said, than he lays down his life for his fellow man. Many times in physical warfare, historically, many men have laid down their lives to save their babies, band of brothers. The natural parallels of spiritual. But Moses thought it was all over too, perhaps. And look what happened. Moses got a fresh, new anointing. And look what he did. This was a prophet. It says that no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses. Until Yeshua showed up, of course. Moses had a fresh, new anointing. And he spoke face to face with Yahweh the Elohim God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Face to face, David found himself, he'd been told about four times, you will be king of Israel. King Saul even said, my son, you'll be the king one day. His son Jonathan said, you will be the king of Israel. Samuel poured that oil over David's head. Abigail even said, you will be king over Israel. So why did David find himself in about 1 Samuel 27 in the land of the Philistines in his enemy's territory, saying like, ah, I guess Saul is going to get me after all. So I better go to the land of my enemies, the Philistines, Philistines, if that's how you want to say it. I better retreat there because it looks like Saul is going to get me. Time out, David. Have you forgotten what Yahweh, the Elohim God of Israel, told you? You're going to be king. Samuel poured the oil over you. But David lost sight. David needed a fresh new anointing. You go read, you go read Psalms, some of the Psalms that David wrote. He suffered. He went through years of tribulation and trials, just like Moses. What about the apostle Paul? He needed a fresh new anointing. He was dragging disciples out of the house and having them killed, having them murdered. What about the Apostle Paul? Did he need a fresh new anointing for what he was called to do? Could the Apostle Paul have walked out and have gone forward if he didn't get that fresh new anointing? Of course not. 
I said in here a few weeks back, I made a short comment that I know, and I've always said this, I've said it before, I, I do respect and I know that each one of us again today is dealing with something in our lives. Or as Bill Cloud sometimes says, it's more than one thing. We're all dealing with something. We all need that fresh anointing. Some of us heard last week some good word because we're home watching Bill's transmission, Jacob's tent. Those of you who listened to Bill last weekend and Beth and some of them, some of the comments from the brothers and sisters there, we all, every one of us, have a decision to make. Are you going to continue to stay in that outer court? Or are you going to walk in to go forward into the inner court? Revelation has something to say about that, I think, in chapter 3 or whatever. Address those in the inner court a certain way, but those in the outer court, basically let them alone. How badly? The question is real simple. It's not a trick question. And I've had to apply it to myself first before I get up here, before I throw it to all of you. How badly do you want that fresh anointing? How much are you willing to sacrifice to get a fresh new anointing from the power of the universe, from the very eternal one, the creator? You can call him Yahweh. You can call him Yahweh. You can call him Yahuwah. You can call him whatever you want. It adds up to the same thing. There's only one entity on his throne. That is the yod heh vav -Heh, the eternal one, the creator, who commissioned Yeshua right beside him to do all things. They're one. Yeshua says, like, in some exasperation, like, don't you yet get it, Peter, John, Matthew, and all you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But it's the Father sitting on that throne in Revelation 5, and the Lamb is the only one worthy to open that scroll standing beside him, which is Yeshua. Jesus the Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Anointed One, Christ the Anointed One, whatever word you want to use, it all still revolves back to the same thing. He's the one that's anointed. That being Yeshua, the Father ordained this. But how badly do we want to come into the inner court? How badly, as Tommy Tenney used to write years ago in his books, The God Chasers, how bad do you want to catch him? He will let himself be caught by us, by you, by me, all of us, if you run after him. And I'll tell you something, if you, if I, if we're willing to pay the price, as David Wilkerson so eloquently said, if we're willing to pay a certain price and sacrifice, you will find he will turn your personal world upside down. There's nothing like having divine chatter all through the day. We've talked recently again, I'll say this again. Yes, the prayer times of nine, three, whenever. That's great. That's fine. He respects that. He receives that. He loves that. Yes. But are you, am I, are we all through our day talking to him about everything in your truck, washing dishes? <laughs> do you laugh with him? I do at times. Something funny happens. I said, Father... That, that's, that's just, you know, that's kind of funny, isn't it? Do you laugh with him during the day? Some, he's got a sense of humor. Remember, Sister Tammy, I told you that. He's got a great sense of humor. He is the one that invented laughter, which is good, like a medicine, the right kind of laughter, the appropriate kind of laughter. But what, are, what price are we willing to pay to have that close personal relationship with him? I want, I want to turn right now and turn this a little bit prophetically to chapter 3 of Amos, if you want to turn there, chapter 3 of Amos. This has been on my mind because of the times that we're living in. And let me make this uh, statement before I read these passages in Amos 3. This is not, so I can't be, you, you might say, somewhat accused of 100% saying, Thus saith Yahweh. But I'm going to tell you again what I've said several times up here in recent years. And I know it now more than I've known it even six months ago or a year ago. We are living in the last days of man's days 
on earth. We are living in the last days where man has total rule. There's coming a time soon here in the footsteps of Messiah, here in the footsteps of Yeshua, he's going to descend in great power. He's going to turn the nations upside down, and he's going to rule the nations, it says in Revelation, with a rod of iron. That simply means he's going to rule in equity, fairness, justice, righteousness. His word will be law. And boy, that's a beautiful time to see that lion laying there with a lamb. And he won't eat the lamb. There will be nothing that hurts or destroys in his holy mountain. That is, I've lived with that since I was a little kid, that vision. I'm closer now than I've ever been. You're closer than you've ever been. We're closer than we've ever been to something so fantastic breaking forth across this earth. And once he does that, it lasts for eternity. Now try to wrap your mind around eternity. We're in the last days, and I say that unabashedly and unapologetically. There's ways I know. I say, again, if some of you want to discuss this with me, I'll be glad. I'm an open book. Come to me. We'll talk about it. There, is what, there are ways he's let me know. He's let, Eddie stood up here, remember, weeks ago. He said, when I was 16 years old, he said he put it strong in my spirit. Remember, Eddie said this, that I would live to see his return. Boy, that struck a chord with me when Eddie said that. Because I've received certain words to myself over the years. Sometimes, like Mary, I hide in my heart until I release it. It says in Amos 3, verse 4, Does a lion roar in the forest when he, when he has no prey? Does a young lion cry out from his den if he has taken nothing? Does a bird fall in a snare on the earth when there is no trout for it? Does a snare spring up from the ground when it has taken nothing? Is a trumpet blown in a city and the people are not afraid? Does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? For the Lord God, the Elohim God of Israel, Yahweh, does nothing without revealing his secret to his servants, the prophets. I was sitting with my three brothers in Huddle House about a year ago back up in North Mississippi. We were having a very good spiritual discussion about several things. And my brother Rick, the oldest, is a very wise, percepted guy. He's pastored for 50 years all across this nation, different places. And Rick was sitting there just listening to the other three. And we were talking about something prophetically, as I remember. And playing off what we just read in Amos, Rick spoke up and said, Guys, brothers, he does nothing until he first reveals his secrets and his plans and his purposes to his prophets. That's part of the fivefold ministry. You think that was just meant for 2,000, 3,000 years ago? I really don't think so. He's already beginning with different individuals to pour out his prophetic spirit very powerfully. And some of them are not yet on the scene. Some of them we don't know yet, but they're out there. And when my brother said that, I said, Rick, what did you say? I heard him. I just wanted him to repeat it. Because my brother Rick had this, he had this work and knowledge of knowing that some things, a pastor's got a certain responsibility, Brother Mark. An evangelist has a certain responsibility and calling. An apostle, on and on and on. There is a reason I say, again, there's a five-fold ministry. It takes the body ministry, it takes each and all of us here with all our different giftings, and oh, there's so many gifts in here. It takes all of us working together to get the whole plan accomplished. As I told my brother yesterday, we had a great conversation on some spiritual issues. I know, I don't have no problem. He, he has not poured everything into me. He has, he has not poured the creation gospel into me like he has Dr. Holy Allwine. He has done that. And he knows some things that I don't know. Bill Clive, whatever, whoever. But then I maybe know some things. He's poured some things into me he hasn't put into them. You see, it's about involving us all, everyone. Every one of us are going to have the opportunity, if we're willing to step forward, to have a place in what he's doing, to have a part in what he's doing. And I think we said recently we can't complain on the part we've been given. And by the way, you think you want a Moses call? You think you want a Jeremiah call, as I've said before up here? I'd be very slow to hold my hand up. Holisa made that comment months ago here, and I called it. She says, if you call yourself a prophet in Babylon, you better make sure you had a burning bush experience. I agree wholeheartedly with her. You better know if he called you to be an apostle. 
You had better know if he calls you to be a prophet. You had better know if he calls you to be a true pastor. Mark, you've told your story many times, brother. You didn't ask for it in the 80s. I didn't ask for what I've been given. A lot of you in here, you didn't ask what you've been given. Even some of you in the ministry, the, the music team, the, you know, that's, not, that's a calling. Torrington, Victoria, and Coleman, all of you. That's a calling. That, those, are, those are powerful gifts. Powerful gifts. I don't have that. I start singing, you'll try to find the exit door. I'll call my wife up Sunday and let her sing. I don't have that. It's all about in love, respecting each other. And it says, to finish up in Amos here, the lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? How in the world, as I rule these words out, how in the world can some of us not step forward, take the mic, and even prophesy because of what we see going on around us? This word is full. We can identify today's times by going to this word if you know where to go. And the prophets are especially full of answers and insight. You know, I read in 2 Timothy chapter 3, you don't have to turn there, verses 1 through 4 or 5. In the last days will be perilous times. It will be very, let me just simplify this. It will be very hard to be a Christian. It will be very hard to be a disciple of Yeshua in the last days. That's what Timothy said. That's what Paul said in Timothy. You know, I'm quoting you right. Can, you t- can I get an amen, a test- testifying here that it's a lot harder to live now than it was 15, 20 years ago? Pull up to Walmart and get your gas tomorrow. And tell me it's a little harder to live now even with gas prices than it was even, say, six months ago or even two months ago. Go buy you a loaf of bread, and when you pay $20 for a loaf of bread, then come back and report to me and tell me what you say, what you think. We are all feeling it. And that's another thing I want to throw it out at you, that I've come to realize some of us have. He's going to protect us. He's going to protect us and watch over us. But that does not mean that he's going to take all of this off from us. We're going to have to go through, and we already are going through a lot of this right now. Why? It's to give us a fresh new anointing. Because if we'll just let it exercise our faith and our trust and our obedience, we're, he's going to make us better. He's going to make us stronger. And it's not for us. I really want to get across today, it is not for us. It's about reaching a hurting world. It's not about us. It is, but yet most of all, he called Israel, remember, he called Israel to be a servant nation, a ministry nation. It's not about superiority. It says in Amos here, you were the lowliest of people when I called you. He doesn't, he doesn't call, he didn't call me because I got an IQ of 160. I do well maybe sometimes I feel I have an IQ of 90. As I told my friend Truman before he died, Truman would tell me, he'd say, Terry, I, I don't have like two brain cells working. I says, Truman, Brother Truman, it's not about your brain cells. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit empowering your mind, empowering your spirit, empowering your life, your actions, your words, who you are. He received it. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit Ruach in us. It's about growing us and maturing us so that we can go on to do greater things for Him and for people. You know, Brother Mark, Pastor Mark, I hope I can say this in the right way, and I want you to receive it right. You've grown tremendously over the years. Even as a speaker, when I first heard you in 2004, the Father has brought you a long way. I say that in all honesty, as I said, I don't flatter. That's a sin. But sometimes I may call someone out where I'm at in acknowledgement of your contributions of the good you've done, the Father's done through you. The Father's grown you, Mark. He's grown you, Tammy. He's grown my wife. He's grown each of us. We're not what we were 5, 10, 15 years ago. And we won't be for a life five years from now, hopefully with a fresh new anointing, if we will seek it like David Wilkerson said, go after it, run after it, chase it. As he said, I am not going to leave this earth a dry twig. I am not going, as Bill Cloud quoted him, I'm, I'm not going to live my life and not fulfill my destiny. 
It's not about being called, per se, a child of God. We're all children of the Father, but it's about fulfilling the particular individual destiny that He has for your life. And corporately, it's about serving as Israel was called and set above all the nations to be a ministering nation, to be a servant nation. It had nothing to do with superiority so they could brag. I want to run as far as I can get from any human pride anymore. Our founding fathers recognized John Adams and Jefferson and Washington. They well recognized. Those were men who read the Bible, the Torah. They knew it. They knew it inside and out. They were not deist. Even Thomas Jefferson, there's been some things pinned on them because revisionist historians have messed they have muddied the water so bad they have passed off a false narrative. And so it's time that some voices are going to be brought forth to set the record straight even on those issues. The truth, as my brother and I were talking yesterday, needs to be told in all areas. It's time to step up, take the mic, speak the truth, go forward and carry that truth to this nation and to the nations and to our fellow communities wherever. People are hurting. They need voices of truth. There's a lot of confusion out there. A lot of confusion. We need the voice of the Lord to split the airwaves and to bring true, to bring true anointing, a fresh new anointing into individual lives, congregations' lives, this nation's life. And as I say again, there's some evidence. I'm waiting myself prophetically to say, how can you but prophesy? I myself am waiting somewhat to try to read, quote, Father, your spiritual tea leaves to know just how much life even is left in America. I don't yet know fully. I see some good signs. Of course, I see a lot of bad signs. When you turn the nuclear family upside down, judgment cannot be far away. You cannot mess most of all with the nuclear family as he established from the Garden of Eden and expect for utter destruction not to be rained down on your nation. It will be rained down even though he loves us. He planted this nation. He planted our brother nation of our Israel, the Jewish people, in 1948. Worked miracles to plant them. He worked many miracles to plant a miracle. Man, I could lecture on that in many seminars, and I think that's coming. I will do that eventually. i got two books written on that eventually I want to get published. This is all addressed and will be addressed later. I'm being open. I'm an open book. This message today involves all of us. The Father's getting ready to do some things as Bill Cloud stood up here one time a few years back and popped his forehead and says, Father, you'd like to give us a lot of things, but we're not ready for it yet. We're not ready for it. What piece of truth does the Father want to give you to? And you would, you would, you would rebuke. You would, you would uh, reject it. Pastor Mark... This is set from the heart, I say, very openly. I say it openly, so I'm judged and assessed according how I mean it and what I say. Do not let him grow you more. Let him mature you more. Let him give you, ask, go and seek even a fresh new anointing. Not that you're not already seeking that. Let him grow you even more, add even more layers of maturity to you to make you an even more effective servant. And do not mince your words in the future what you say. You say what he gives you to say. If you too don't want to play it, fine. He's got ways of going around YouTube, okay? It's come time for us to step forward and say what needs to be said. Now understand in love and humility, and compassion for people. I say again, whether it's my ministry, something I do, or Sunrise do, or whatever, or you do, Mark, any of us pastor, it must go under the banner, most of all, of his divine love, because he loves mankind. He gave his son, John 3, 16, we quote all the time, that all mankind might eventually have life. Oh, but it's time to... We're living in echoes and shades of Daniel 12. I don't have to tell all of you this. I think most of you know your word, you know your Torah, you know that Bible from Genesis to Revelation. But we're living in, now we're living in the times of Daniel 12, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30. I came to my wife in May of 2005 on a Sunday morning. 
And I said, you know, honey, I think I've got it figured out what the Father's been trying to show me. This is the 2005 in May. I says, Jacob's trouble is coming soon. That's 17 years ago. You know, soon to the Father is not exactly soon to how I perceive soon. But it, I, I knew then, look how much worse things have gotten in the last 17 years since I told my wife that. And I looked at my wife also. I says, honey, I would not come and even tell you unless I was pretty sure of what he's showing me and telling me. I do nothing until I first tell my servants, my prophets. Guess what? All Terry has to do, all you have to do is get in the prophets and hear who he spoke to. It's full. The prophets are full. Amos, Hosea, Ezekiel, I love those prophets. Those men who were used so powerfully, who spoke right to the heart of Israel, the heart. You've got to get that heart first before you transform the mind, Romans 12. You've got to, turn, you've got to get that heart grab. Then you transform the mind, Romans 12. You start to teach and educate. That's a lifetime of discipling. Those disciples he pulled closer three, three and a half years. He had to first get their attention, get their heart. Then he started to disciple them and to grow them and to mature them till they reached the point before they died and passed from this earth. They turned, I say again, the world upside down with the fresh anointing that he put on them. Do you want that? It's coming. One other thing. We all we, we, we speak of the gifts. And too much of the time, the focus... The focus sometimes is too much put on, let's say, the gifts of prophecy. That's great. Prophetic gifts are great. Tongues, interpretation, nothing wrong with that. That's a gift. That has value. That has merit. Teaching, be able to teach. But I want to tell you something. Get very personal here. That's touched my heart. Has touched Sandra's heart. That's recently touched some of your hearts in here. I want to see the day. I have prayed over people in the past that were dying. I've said this before, and I've prayed over people even dying of cancer, and they didn't get up out of their bed. And I had to process that. I had to deal with that. Yet I read, Yeshua said, the things that I did, you will do greater things. Peter, if you could raise the dead. Elijah, if you could raise the dead. Paul, if you could raise the dead. Well, you sure? What about us in 2022? We need a fresh anointing so that when we lay our hands or we pray for someone, I don't care for stage 10 cancer, they're going to put that mat down and be healed on the spot. I've witnessed one personally, one personal healing in my life, holding my young nephew in my hands at the Feast of Tabernacle, Sakoti, in Biloxi, Mississippi, in 1983. He'd broken a bone in his wrist. I've been privy to witness one Miracle healing. And just before that x-ray swung over my young nephew's arm that he had broken, it had been checked by two or three technicians and said, it's a break, get him in there and take an x-ray where the break's at and all that. He looks up at my youngest brother, his dad, and says, Daddy, it don't hurt anymore. Just as that x-ray swung over his little arm, that young nephew of mine was healed. He was prayed over by the elders before we left the Coliseum there in Biloxi to take him to the hospital. He was in my arms. He was hurting so bad. He had a rash all over him. I witnessed that. I don't have a question that he heals and can heal and has healed. What I'm saying is we want that healing power to show up where people that's got diseases that are healed, they're healed. And certainly, you're right, Pastor Mark, Isaiah 61, we want a total healing, mind, spirit, body physically, whatever, but I'm really focusing on, our, many of us have lost loved ones to horrible diseases like cancer. My wife and I have lost both our mothers to cancer. Cancer itself is a horrible scourge. It's time that we ask the Father, fresh new anointing, to pour out healing gifts in our midst. Fresh anointing. Some of us have dealt with crippling anxiety for years on and off, and you know who you are. You want me to hold my hand up? There's been times I knew why it was happening. I'm, I'm being very honest and open here. I've been attacked by the demonic because they know they don't want me speaking. They don't want me going forward. They've tried to stop me, as David Wilkerson said. Every demon from the pit of hell will try to stop you at times. Are you going to let that happen? 
But a lot of you have dealt in here with crippling anxiety. That's not pleasant. That's not a pleasant thing. I read recently, blew me away. I didn't know this. Harry Truman, President Harry Truman, is one president that I'm not done a lot of study and reading on. So recently I, I decided I wanted to read an autobiography about Harry. I wanted to know more about him. Did you know that our president, Harry S. Truman, suffered from acute anxiety? And he was president. He was president. Yet look what he did. Look what he accomplished. A two-term president. There's a lot of issues in here that we can have. You can just take your pick that we need a fresh new anointing on. But are we like Psalms 42 says, do we pant like the deer after water? Do we really want it? David wanted it. I believe David wrote in pen, as a, I mean Psalms 42. David wanted it. This passionate warrior, this passionate king. How badly, I say again, do you, do I want it? Will you put your phone down at times? Will you turn the TV off at times? Will you get in his face at times? Will you talk to him all through the day? Sometimes it's like divine chatter, and not only you're talking to him, you're hearing things back in your spirit. And maybe you're hearing, maybe you're hearing all of a voice. I remember dear, dear Merle Frazier, remember, said he was in his car that day years ago. He says, Lord, what is, like, what is, uh, what is success in your mind? He says, I heard the all of a voice. Some of you may remember uh, Brother Merle said this. He says, I heard the all of a voice. Says, success is being what I called you to be. <laughs> he said, I like to wreck my car. He may speak to you in an all of a voice. I've had, I've had him call my name in an all of a voice about a couple times in my life. And I mean, when he did, I came to attention. I knew what I was hearing. I knew when I was hearing it. You, I want your attention, my son. But it takes getting up close and personal with him. It takes, as we said, as Bill said last week in his message, and some of his people in Jacob's Den, it takes coming into the inner court. You can't stay in the outer court. Any of us. Let me read this, and I'll step down after I read this. It is not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the door of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives violently, violently, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory or defeat. There is a reason that quote by Teddy Roosevelt, and that man got placed on Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmore, one of our greatest presidents, Teddy Roosevelt. I can phrase it like this. How many of us are willing to step forward and to enter the arena to carry the torch of truth, righteousness, and justice, no matter the cost? The cost of discipleship, is discipleship, as David Wilkerson said. Who, like Isaiah, will say, he nanny sent me? Halisa, when she was here, when she closed out one of the sessions, I, I'm just trying to remember if it was that morning or that afternoon when she said, reap. And there was that, the footsteps of Messiah. We all, because we talked about it later, just sensed um, the presence. And I can tell you that um, our father has always, and he, I don't foresee him changing, has always worked through the same patterns all the way through history. So you can discern and know, and the Issachars of the world will discern accurately the days that we're in. And since uh, 2005, for sure, even, I'm going to say even, because you and I were talking about this the other day, even since 2015, we have catapulted in a different thing. Now, here's the pattern of what the Father does. He, tell, he told the mixed multitude at the mountain to go cleanse themselves for how many days? Three days. Two days. On the third day, I'm coming. And, and that's what I had in my mind, because he's coming to meet them. 
on the third day. And prophetically, we are on the third day from Yeshua and his blood, which cleanses us from all unrighteousness, has been working with his people to prepare us for his return. But there's always going to be, then he brings them and he gives them their orders. And then we say, all that you say, we will do. Only let's don't do what they did and, and get into golden calf worship. So there's a great responsibility, a great cleansing, a great resolve that we have to get. And it is going to come through the intimacy of spending time with him every day to hear the voice of the Spirit, because the words that he gave to Yochanan on the Isle of Patmos was the Spirit and the bride say, come. And are we going to be able to hear, or do we have a lot of noise in our ears? So he's getting our homes in order. First, let me say this. He's getting our lives in order individually. He's getting our homes in order He's getting our congregation in order. Our nation will be have a chance to get it. It's going to be in order regardless because Yeshua is going to upright everything. What we go through to be a part of the order that it's coming into is where we have to be prepared. As uh, Terry said, he's trying to distance himself from as much pride as possible. I, that may not have been exactly the way you said it, but it was along those lines. Because the reason we have to be prepared Uh, and ready and have no pride, he can't use us if we think it's because of us. But he can use us if we know it's in spite of us. Because it ain't about us. It's about his kingdom. And we do it in our everyday lives and how we serve one another and those at large. Because we do serve in the community outside of this local community. So, hands and feet of Yeshua, it's on there. But I think it fits because the anointing came after they cleansed themselves. They get their marching orders. And then we, but it's, but submit to the work of the Spirit so that we can individually and corporately be prepared to be used and go through whatever it is that we have to go through and uh, be there for one another. Amen. All together. Sound the great shofar for our freedom. Raise the banner to gather our exiles and gather us together from the four corners of the earth. Praised are you, O Yahweh, who gathers in the dispersed of your people, Israel. Prayer for the United States of America all together. Abba Father, giver of life, we pray for and entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of life, liberty, and blessings. We cry out for this land to be reclaimed for your glory. May it be that you will dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch and open the hearts of our nation and its leaders to seek your will and your ways. Grant us the ability and courage to stand for the truth. And may we be that righteous nation you have called us to be. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Prayer for the peace of Jerusalem all together. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of Yahweh. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem that is built as a city that is compact together, to which the tribes go up, even the tribes of Yahweh, an ordinance for Israel, to give thanks to the name of Yahweh, for there thrones were set for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. May peace be within your walls and prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brothers and my friends, I will now say, may peace be within you. For the sake of the house of Yahweh Elohim, I will seek your good. Amen. Berkat HaKonim, the blessing of the priest. Adonai, 
Veishmerecha Yair Adonai Panav lecha vihuneka Yis Adonai Panav lecha Veyasem lecha Lecha shalom May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his favor unto you and give you shalom. Amen. And it's time again for the Kiddush, the blessing over the wine. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri Hagafen, Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, you are the branches. And the blessing over the bread. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, HaMotzi Lechem Min HaAretz, Amen. Blessed are you, O Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. It is Shabbat, thank the Lord. It is Shabbat. 